Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to this wonderful event for Landessa. What a great pleasure it is for me to be back in Seattle, where I spent some of the happiest times of my entire life during the 16 years that I lived here. My story about Landessa began 46 years ago, when I first met Roy Prosterman in the year 1977 through my second husband, whose name was Egil Bud Krogh. This evening, I would like to share two brief stories about doing field work with Roy. First, Bud Krogh's experience in 1973 in Vietnam, and then my own trip to the Philippines in 1983. Sadly, Bud passed away three years ago in 2020, but he played a very significant role in advancing Roy's amazing career. When Bud and I first met, we were both living in Marin County, California, just north of San Francisco, and he talked to me more about Roy and his land reform work than almost anything else. And that is saying a lot because Bud had had a very dramatic and dynamic life. Still, he spoke with such passion about Roy's work, and he was so very eager for me to meet Roy. Bud grew up in Seattle and was a graduate of the University of Washington Law School, where he had taken Roy's course in global land tenure law. What is more, during his law school years, Bud had volunteered to go during spring vacation to be Roy's assistant on a two-week trip to do field work in Vietnam right when the Vietnamese War was raging and at its most controversial and upsetting to our country. Despite almost incredible obstacles on that trip with Bud, Roy had been able to get the information he needed about Vietnam's land tenure laws and the latest Vietnamese Supreme Court decisions about land tenure, as well as having interviews with peasant farmers in the fields and with wealthy landowners and their advisors. After his trip with Bud to Vietnam, Roy used the information they had gleaned there to write a brilliant land reform law, perfectly tailored to the existing laws and conditions in Vietnam. But then they faced this overwhelming question. How could they possibly get that sweeping new land reform passed and implemented in war-torn Vietnam? That challenge seemed really insurmountable. How would they ever be able to pass fee simple titles? And in those days, the titles were small paper documents to the peasants in a poverty-stricken country and to do so in the midst of that terrible war. Well, here, at this point, the story takes an almost unbelievable twist. Miraculously, surprisingly, Within just two years, Bud found himself working in the office of the President of the United States in the White House in Washington, D.C. How on earth could that possibly have happened, you may certainly well ask. Well, in circumstances completely unrelated to Roy, Richard Nixon was elected president in 1969 and he hired John Ehrlichman, a prominent lawyer from Seattle, who had worked on and contributed to Nixon's campaign, to be counsel to the president and later to be chief domestic advisor to the president. The Krogh and Ehrlichman families had been very close friends in Seattle for decades, and John Ehrlichman had known Bud growing up for years. John Ehrlichman, who was born, who, who died in 1999, was 12 years older than Bud and needed bright young staffers to work for him in D.C. So he asked Bud if he would come to Washington and work for him in his office in the White House. 
clearly because both John Ehrlichman and Bud Krogh knew Roy and deeply understood and supported the importance of Roy's concepts as being crucial to creating a stable agricultural reform and because Bud serendipitously brought fresh reports from his own field work on that recent land reform trip to Vietnam. The combined efforts of John and Bud persuaded President Nixon to fast track the implementation of Roy's land reform in Vietnam. It was absolutely astonishing. Both John and Bud were devoted to Roy's cause and because they were incredibly at the highest levels of government in the White House where they had convinced President Nixon that the land reform in Vietnam was crucial and would arguably help to end that awful war. And amazingly, President Nixon gave Roy's plan his full support and ordered its complete implementation. And Roy was a consultant during the entire process. So there you have it. In the middle of the Vietnam War, with the full support of the President of the United States, John Ehrlichman and Bud Krogh both saw to it that Roy's plan for land reform received unprecedented help and several arms of the United States government participated. Both the United States State Department and USAID, the Agency for International Development, essentially directed and instructed by the Office of the President of the United States, completely installed Roy's land reform laws in their entirety as fast as possible and in every detail exactly as Roy had designed it. Arguably, Roy's land reform significantly changed the trajectory of the entire Vietnam War. Staggeringly, within only a very few months of those paper titles having been passed to the starving tenant farmers in Vietnam, indigenous recruitment to the Viet Cong, the enemy, was dramatically reduced almost to zero because the peasant farmers who now owned their own land did not want to leave it to go and fight and risk their lives in some war they didn't really fully understand. And what is more, they were now willing to invest what Roy calls sweat equity in their new land. And crop yields from the very same rice paddy or grain field almost immediately skyrocketed from two to fourfold. It was a stunning demonstration of the enormous power of what Roy called his land to the tiller program and of the power of land ownership laws to determine political outcomes. Now you might well be wondering how did I, a young woman from the Middle West, find myself involved in the very creation and founding of what would become Landessa, a global organization based in Seattle which has had and is still having such enormous and widespread impact. How did I get so lucky. Well, I was born and raised in Kansas City, where I had, after graduating from Wellesley College in Boston, Massachusetts, married and had two daughters. And at that time, in the early 1960s, when I was graduating from college, it was not yet fully acceptable for women like me from my privileged background to have careers or jobs. So I had followed in the footsteps of my dear and brilliant mother, who had devoted many decades to working in leadership roles in a variety of community charities in Kansas City. And after 15 years of hard work, always purely as a volunteer, I found myself having been elected to leadership jobs in a variety of charitable organizations where I had served, for example, as president of the Junior League of Kansas City and chairman of the board of the private girls school which my daughters attended and a board delegate to the National Association of Independent Schools in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, 
vice chair of the board of the largest hospital serving the indigent in Kansas City, and board chair of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Kansas City, among others. And all of those entities are denoted in the U.S. tax code under the heading 501c3, which defines charities. So basically, I had been carefully trained in how to form, govern, grow, and fund that kind of charitable entity. Simply put, I had been carefully taught how to do it. Then, after 15 years of marriage, raising my daughters, and working in our city, circumstances changed. I was divorced and in 1977 found the courage to leave behind my comfortable and privileged life and many precious friends and to venture out to find a new life. I moved with my two daughters to the little town of Larkspur in Marin County, just across the Golden Gate Bridge north of San Francisco, where I bought a nice house and was settling into a quiet life. It was just at that moment that through a mutual friend, I was introduced to Bud Krogh. After six months, Bud and I married and eventually moved to Seattle. Once Bud and I were settled in our new home in Medina, I was at last, for the first time, living in the same city with Roy, and I began to meet regularly with him at a little place called Werner's Cafe in the U District. Well, once settled in Seattle, I began to realize that Roy had absolutely no organizational support of any kind for his work. At that time, he was essentially unknown. He had only his law professor's salary, with which he was paying for all his own travel expenses to whatever foreign country where he was working. He had created RDI, the Rural Development Institute, a legal 501c3, but it had no truly functioning board, and RDI existed really in name only. He could only travel when law school was in recess, he could not afford to give up his teaching salary, and he was spending most of that salary on his work for the world. So you can now understand how it became immediately obvious to me that Roy needed a proper 501c3 organization with a fully functioning board which would undertake to fund his work and provide him a salary and expenses for his travel and a permanent office space for the work rather than working out of his apartment. Funds were needed to pay for flights, hotels, interpreters, and a car and driver for the field work. There was such a lot of work to be done. <clears throat> I was brand new in town, but my daughter Laura had been accepted to attend Lakeside School for high school, and I learned that two of her classmates were our neighbors. They were Sarah Piggott and Billy Ruckelshaus. Both lived just two blocks away. So I was immediately introduced to Gay and Jim Piggott and Jill and Bill Ruckel's house, and we formed a carpool for school. So then I began having small dinner parties in our home where Bud and I would invite two or three couples to come for an evening, and we invited Roy and Jeff Reedinger, Roy's first assistant, and later Tim Hanstad when Tim replaced Jeff. And the Piggots and the Ruckels houses were the first couples we invited. Well, during those early dinner parties, Bud would tell a story or two about his field work in Vietnam, and I would ask Roy to say a few words about his ideas and work. It was a very soft sell, but I was gradually able to bring Roy to the attention of some of the most influential and intelligent people in his own hometown, whom I was just so very fortunate to know. Then also, with some sense of desperation, I began holding board meetings also at our home, and gradually a genuinely functioning board grew and became truly engaged, and significant funding began to be found. Of great importance, I want to say at this juncture 
that through all these years and decades, Tim and Chitra Hanstad were absolutely crucial at every step. From launching these very first meetings of the new board of RDI, and ever since, as we all know, they have de devoted their lives to the work of Landessa. And what is more, they have been, for all these years, Roy's only family. Roy was an only child and was utterly alone in the world. The first goal of the new board was to raise enough money to buy out Roy's law professor's salary so he could afford to stop teaching and devote full time to land reform. Now from the outset, Bud had encouraged me to also go on a field work trip with Roy so that I too could see him in action and really grasp what this work in the field really meant. Roy had been studying the terrible land problems under the unstable government in the Philippines. And when their corrupt dictator, Ferdinand Marcos, was ousted in the early 1980s, Vice President Benigno Aquino became president. And Roy saw a moment of opportunity to try and reach President Aquino about the need to implement his land reform ideas. Then, even more shocking news came from Manila that the new President Aquino had been assassinated in 1983, just shortly before we were planning to depart from Seattle. And then President Aquino's widow, Corazon Aquino, became the President of the Philippines. And Roy began trying desperately to reach her through various contacts he knew in the government. So hastily, he planned a trip to Manila, and one of his young law students, Michael Furtado, and I set off with him for a three-week trip to the Philippines. Now, the Philippines was at that time a very wild and lawless place. We observed that there were armed guards in uniform at government buildings, hotels, restaurants and office buildings holding loaded rifles over their shoulders. <clears throat> Most ordinary businessmen walking along the streets of Manila carried pistols visible in holsters. One day, after being there for about 10 days, coming back from a long, tiring morning spent out in some sugarcane fields, we arrived back at our hotel about 2 o'clock p.m. The concierge at the hotel, which was a big Hilton hotel, was a lady who knew Roy from earlier trips which he had made to Manila. She saw us returning as we walked across the lobby, and she urgently motioned us to come into her office. She told us that earlier in the day, several men who were armed, not surprisingly, had come to the hotel and were asking for Roy by name. She seemed very uneasy about them. She told Roy what town they were from, and he recognized that it was an area where there was known resistance to his work. She said that the armed men had left, but they told her that they would be back when Roy had returned. And I could tell that she was genuinely concerned. This was a real an unexpected shock. It brought to mind the fact that some years earlier, three of Roy's colleagues in El Salvador had been gunned down and killed in a cafe where they were meeting to discuss his land reform plans. Those men in, El in San Salvador were meeting to form a farm workers collective and had been assassinated, Roy reasoned, by henchmen of some of the biggest landowners in the country who did not understand that they would have been paid fairly and fully for their land. Well, that afternoon in Manila, Michael became genuinely frightened and wanted to return home right away. Roy was greatly dismayed but did not want to leave Manila precipitously after so much work had gone into the progress we were making. <clears throat> 
and into setting up meetings we had worked so hard to schedule for the coming days. Roy wanted to stay, but to keep a low profile and try to finish our meetings. I was worried, and remembering the tragedy in El Salvador, I suggested that we each just go to our hotel rooms where we would be perfectly safe and take a short rest, and then we would make our plans, and I said I would call them. Clearly, at that moment, I became, by default, the in-charge person, and I was going to have to make this decision and organize our actions. Michael was going to leave for sure, and I needed to change his plane ticket right away. The question was whether Roy and I would stay. I fully understood how close we were to having some crucial meetings with pivotal people, and I too was fully invested, as Roy was, in how much progress we were making. I got to my room and sat quietly on the edge of my bed, feeling such deep disappointment but knew that I had to take the intelligent, conservative approach. And then suddenly, this simple question arose in my mind. What would you tell your children to do if they were here in this exact situation instead of me? Leave immediately, was the obvious answer. So I called Roy in his room and explained that we simply had to leave. I said that, of course, I knew how he felt. I, too, was crushed. But I told him that the risk was simply too great. I reminded him about El Salvador. And I told him that we, he had many years of work ahead, and we needed to remember that. Cutting this trip short needed to be seen in that light. It was just a temporary setback. Then I called TWA to get our flights out of Manila changed to depart immediately that afternoon. And I asked the ticket agent on the phone, what time is the next flight leaving Manila? And she said, six o'clock p.m. Good, I said, and are there three seats available? And she said, yes. So I said, we would take that flight. And then I gave her our ticket numbers because in those days, we had paper tickets with long serial numbers, and that took quite a little bit of time. Then just before hanging up the last thing, I suddenly remembered to ask her was, oh, tell me, where is the flight going? Because in my rush, I had completely forgotten to ask. Hong Kong, she said. Wonderful, I replied. Actually, it didn't even matter, because wherever that flight was going, we were going to be on it. When it was time to leave the hotel, rather than depart through the bustling lobby and out the big main doors and the driveway of the hotel, where Roy would be exposed to the public, the concierge with whom I had been talking kindly arranged for us to leave through the gate in the fence that was around the swimming pool, which opened onto the back street behind the hotel. She arranged for our car and driver to meet us back there on that quiet side street. Finally, once safely in the cab, we three broke into a moment of very nervous laughter, feeling a sort of shock at realizing what had just happened. It felt almost like we were in a spy movie, slipping out of the side door by the swimming pool to escape to a waiting car to the airport. Well, we flew to Hong Kong, which turned out to be a great stopover. Michael connected immediately to his flight home to Seattle, but Roy and I spent four quite productive days there. Roy knew many land reform friends and colleagues in Hong Kong, and we met with several of them in the lobby of our hotel. He also managed to keep a few appointments which we had worked so hard to set up back in Manila because he was able to speak with them by telephone. So all was not lost. Mostly, though, I got to see Roy as I had never seen him before, 
standing out there in the insufferable heat and humidity for hours in the farm fields and rice paddies, speaking through an interpreter with impoverished tenant farmers. Well, Bud was certainly right. Going on that field trip taught me things about Roy and about his work and the world that I could never have understood without it. It galvanized my determination to work tirelessly for RDI, now Landessa, and it cemented my friendship with Roy. We here all share in a deep appreciation of this unique man of such genuine global stature, of whose work we are all the lucky ones to be able to encourage and support through Landessa in whatever way we can. And now, 46 years after that trip to Manila, the process of institutionalizing Landessa away from being the work of a single man and into a powerful organization combining the talents and skills of many disciplines and many people around the world has been smoothly accomplished and RDI has been absorbed into history and has been replaced now by the shining light of Landessa. I congratulate all of you who make Landessa what it is today. I am so grateful to have been given an opportunity to share a long part of my life in the service of Roy Prosterman's enormous life work. And all of you here in this room may take comfort and pride in knowing that through your support of Landessa, you too have actually had and will continue to have an indelible, positive impact on the history of our planet. And I ask you this, how many people can say that? That they have had a lasting positive influence on the very shaping of the history of our planet. Well, you, each one of you can very definitely say it. Thank you.